Daddy and me joined Ayuka on the same day, August 5, 1992. And uh, this was uh, Hadi soon after I had joined. And so uh, before, I'm sorry? He's so happy with you. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> so he's happy because of he, he won the Batnagar then. So. OK. So and uh, this is Tarun, Jasjeet, and Bala. And um, this was, it's not changing. This is uh, Paddy as I was completing my thesis. Um, well, it's been, uh, you know, um, all his guidance, friendship, and support has proved invaluable to me over the years. And uh, I continue to count on his uh, support and guidance. Thank you, Paddy. So let me, sorry? <laughs> so you need, you need some explanation about potatoes and, uh, and his reluctance to exert himself physically. I'll, say a few things later. <laughs> All right, so let's get back to the physics. Inflation is uh, a rather compelling paradigm. Uh, it's an efficient paradigm, but the efficiency of the inflationary paradigm also seems to be responsible for its major drawback. There are just too many models of inflation. And uh, as I shall argue, it's not clear that inflation, you know, while as a paradigm it's a success, we are far from you know, converging on specific models of inflation. And also, it's not clear that we can prove falsify inflation. And in such a scenario, it seems, uh, you know, important, even imperative, to consider alternative models of inflation. There aren't many. There is only one, you know, which is popular in the market, which are bouncing models, which come with its own plethora of problems. I will talk about it towards the end. And uh, I started studying bouncing models uh, because I thought non-gaussianities will be large in bouncing models and we will rule them out. We were studying, you know, non-gaussianities three-point functions primarily in inflationary models and uh, we recognized that, you know, in bouncing models, perturbations will grow as one approaches the bounce. I will illustrate with a picture as I go along and these will boost non-gaussianities and therefore, you know, bouncing models are possibly dead. We find that that is not quite true the scalar non-gaussianities remain to be evaluated satisfactorily to my, you know, to my satisfaction, but we have been able to calculate other types of non-gaussianities and this expectations that non-gaussianities will generically be large is not, doesn't seem to be necessarily true. It is in this context we started studying bouncing models and here is an outline of my talk. I talked about the first part and I will just make a few brief remarks about inflation and then I will talk about the bouncing scenarios of my interest. And then I will illustrate how you can generate uh, a tensor. I will focus on tensors because they are simpler. Scalars need more modeling and you need crazy models to drive bounces. And I will not touch about scalars at all in this, um, uh, in this talk. I will focus on tensors and it's easy to illustrate, you know, the growth of the perturbations, how you can get scale invariant spectra, etc. And then I will talk about the tensor by spectrum and I will illustrate that it is not large. It's in fact, you know, much smaller compared to say d zeta inflation, which also leads to scale invariant power spectrum. And this talk is essentially based on a paper I had written with my students, you know, current student Devika Chaudhary and former student Srina. There are many, many, many models of inflation. This is a list, you know, of a decade and a half old and uh, there have been, you know, updates to it and there is a systematic comparison of models with the data. And, uh, oops. And the point is, it's not clear some of these models will even be ruled out by the data. And here is a comparison of models. It's not, you know, there's not a stage to talk about how well models do. You know, certain types of small feed models which lead to a, you know, small tensor to scalar ratio are quite consistent with the data. And this is, a, you know, there has been a systematic effort by Jerome Martin and his co-workers where they compare about close to 200 inflationary models with the data and they have a Bayesian evidence for each of these models. And a class of models, you know, very close to, you know, very similar in some sense to the original R plus R squared model of Starobinsky work well against the data. But the problem is, can inflation be, be falsified? There have been arguments that, you know, when BICEP came in, it was touted as, I know, as supporting inflation. And when BICEP went away, we still believe, you know, it is all the evidence point to inflation. I think inflation is a very robust paradigm. 
but the challenge is going to remind that you know uh, is about falsifying. I, what I would say is that given the data, I will be able to construct an inflationary model that is quite consistent with the data. I'm assuming there are no external inputs from theory as to what kind of models we desire. If we have these additional inputs, yes, we will have a smaller bunch of inflationary models that are consistent with the data. Else, you know, if you want features, I can provide you models. Features with large non-gaussianities, possible. You know, no features, large non-gaussianities is possible. The only thing which is somewhat tricky, seems to be tricky, is having, you know, um, small non-gaussianities and features. And I'm sure if you fool around with the models, you will be able to construct them as well. And the second point is that over the last, uh, uh, you know, few years, there have been a lot of uh, effects which were originally sort of ignored during inflation have been taken into account. In, during inflation, we have always assumed that it is the inflaton field that plays the, you know, significant role. There have been, you know, uh, coupling to gauge fields that have been considered and their role on the power spectra. So if you allow additional fields to play a role during inflation, there'll be more features in your power, power spectrum, there are more parameters, and therefore, you know, your constraints will become loose. I think the challenge reminds as to whether an inflationary model can be falsified. It is in the scenario, it is in this situation that we started considering bouncing scenarios. What are these? scenarios, well, they correspond to situations wherein the universe initially goes through a period of contraction until the scale factor reaches a minimum and then begins a phase of expansion. They offer an alternative to inflation, as I will quickly uh, explain. You know, at very early times during the contracting phase, you can impose sub-Hubble initial conditions very much like you can do in the context of inflation. This has been recognized for a, quite a long while. However, there are many difficulties with bouncing models. Inflation is easy to achieve. A well-motivated bouncing model is difficult to construct. There are some pathologies always lurking around the co corner. Matter fields, for instance, have to violate the null energy condition. I will illustrate where they need to violate, okay? And of course, you know, um, there is concern whether such an assumption, bouncing model, is valid in a domain, you know, close to the Big Bang, where general relativity, quantum, I'm sorry, quantum gravitational effects are expected to take over. What we will focus on are classical bounces. The particular model I will talk about, you know, I will illustrate as to how the energy density always remains much smaller than the Planckian scales. The resolution of the horizon problem, you know, this is the horizon problem during inflation. The forward light cone is much smaller than the backward light cone in the ab absence of inflation. You have a vertical axis which is conformal time coordinate and the same thing you have here, and as you know, inflation allows the conformal time to be negative, so we can start at a sufficiently early time so that the forward light cone is as big as the backward light cone. And this is essentially what bouncing models also do. It allows eta to be negative so that you can start at a sufficiently early epoch so that your forward light cone is as big as the backward light cone at the epoch of decoupling. There is another way of stating this, you know, this is well known. You have plotted logarithm of length versus the E folds, and there are two scales here, the wavelengths, which are proportional to the scale factor, and the Hubble scale during inflation. As you know, you can bring these modes well inside, scales of cosmological interest well inside the Hubble scale if you have a sufficiently long epoch of inflation. And this is essentially what happens in the case of a bouncing model as well. What has been done in the next figure is that this figure, you know, has been sort of rotated by 90 degrees. The vertical axis is my time coordinate and the horizontal axis is, is length. So what has been plotted are two scales, you know, um, not on a log-log plot as in the previous picture. Uh, so the two scales are the wavelength of the perturbation, which is in red, and the Hubble radius, which is in blue. Since the Scale factor has a minimum at the bounds. The Hubble scale blows up at the bounds. And you can have at very early times where the wavelength of the perturbation is much smaller than the Hubble radius. And this can happen provided you have a non-accelerating phase of contraction. For instance, if you have matter-dominated epoch at very early times, you can have modes well inside the Hubble radius and you can impose your bunch Davis initial conditions and evolve them later. So the violation of the null energy condition, it is around this bouncing, you know, I'm sorry, it's around the bounds, the violation of the null energy condition occurs. I'll just illustrate it uh, with the help of a, uh, with the help of a, um, 
uh, figure in a, in, a, in, a, in a slide later. So the kind of you know, scenarios, if you're interested in the kind of scale factor we are interested in, we can consider a completely symmetric bouncing scenario like this. The Q equal to one corresponds to a matter bounds because at very early times during the contracting phase at large negative eta, it will behave like eta squared, which corresponds to a matter dominated epoch. And if you are interested in asking what kind of matter fields you require in order to drive this bounds, you need two fluids typically. Uh, you will need one which behaves like matter to drive the early contraction, and you need something which behaves like radiation, but importantly has a negative energy density. It is this negative energy density which is undesirable, obviously, and it is you know what actually helps you achieve the bounds. And uh, uh, so, in order to display these graphs, you know some of the graphs I'm going to in order to understand the graph, some of some of the graphs I'm going to display it is useful to introduce a new time variable. In the context of inflation, we introduce this E fold. That's familiar, it's logarithm of the scale factor, but E fold, and you know, if, you are, if you've studied the evolution of perturbations during inflation, for instance, if you want to numerically evolve them, you use this E fold to evolve the perturbation variables because you need to, you, you need to consider essentially 60 E folds of inflation or so. Since E power N is a monotonically increasing function, this is not a convenient you know, variable to study evolution of perturbations in the context of bouncing models. So we introduce something called E and false, which is related to the, you know, and it is related to the scale factor in this fashion. And the figures I will be plotting will be with respect to this E and false script N. So here is the behavior of H dot and rho. Remember H dot is equal to minus rho plus P. And so what you essentially have is that very close to the bounds, H dot is positive, H dot has to be negative if you don't want to violate the weak energy condition, H, the weak energy condition has to be violated around the bounds for a very small period of time. And uh, it, this is where that negative row plays a role. This is where it becomes significant. And uh, how does the total row behave? Total row of course remains positive and it vanishes at the bounds and the maximum value is much, much smaller. The rho by MPL power four is much, much smaller than the Planckian energy density. So I can consider this bouncing scenario to be completely classical. There is only one parameter in the problem that I had, you know, in the scale factor that I had written, namely the value of the scale factor at the bounds, and we will see that is what essentially determines the amplitude of the two-point function. So under what conditions can you get a scale invariant power spectrum? We'll focus on tensors for simplicity, as I mentioned. And there is a well-known duality between d sitter and matter bounds, and that is easy to understand. If you know the equations governing the so-called mukhanov sasaki variable that describes the tensor perturbation, this UK, it satisfies an equation like this, where A is the scale factor, and primes, as Sage had, denotes differentiation with respect to the conformal time coordinate. And it is well known that if you carry out this you know, transformation, it is invariant under this transformation, this equation. And therefore, you know, your tensor power spectrum can be expected to be invariant under two scale factors, A and A tilde, which are related by this transformation. And you can ask, what is A tilde corresponding to D sitter? Well, it happens to be the matter bound scenario that I was describing. So you expect a you know, scale invariant power spectrum from the matter bounds. And this is the behavior of A double prime by A, which determines the evolution of the tensor modes in a matter bounds. And this is, you know, contracting phase, this is the expanding phase. And if you had just inflation, it would have stopped somewhere here. A prime by, A double prime by A would have just grown, gone, grown indefinitely. Okay, here modes, you know, remember the equation, Mokunov Sasaki equation is like a scattering problem in quantum mechanics. So your modes come in here, you know, these are the sub-Hubble domain, and once they enter this, they are in the super-Hubble domain, the amplitude of the modes freeze and in, uh, in, in inflation, and that is what happens in the bounds as well. And you can evaluate this power spectrum, you know, before, much later, you expect it to transit to a radiation-dominated epoch in the, you know, in the, uh, in the expanding phase, and you can, so you calculate the power spectrum somewhere here. And how do the modes behave? The modes behave in this fashion, because of, you know, remember, it, they are like a uh, 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 damped oscillator in an expanding universe, but the damping becomes like anti-damping. So the amplitude of these modes grow, and once the universe starts expanding, the amplitudes start freeze, uh, begins to freeze, and you can calculate the power spectrum somewhere here. They begin to oscillate much later when they have gone through the potential completely. 
And you can ask what kind of power spectra you can get. You can get a power spectra, which is scale invariant. We have carried out an analytical approximation. Therefore, this approximation is valid only at small scales. And over these scales, you can get a scale invariant power spectra of the right amplitude. For instance, if you have A0, the scale factor at the bounds to be 10 power my 5 or so. Now, that is as far as two-point functions are concerned. How about three-point functions? What is the three-point function in a batter bound scenario? How does it compare with Zeta? <coughs> Well, a few quick words about how to calculate uh, three-point functions. Well, the three-point function that we are interested in, the tensor three-point function is defined as follows. It's called the tensor bispectrum. It is this B which appears here. You know, we scale it by some factors of two pi to get a G which appears in this quantity here. What is this? HNL is like FNL that you may have heard of for the scalar three-point function, but this is for the tensor three-point function. It is essentially a dimensionless ratio of the three-point function to a suitable combination of, uh, of the three-point function to the two-point function. And we are interested in asking what this is. And if you, you can, it is straightforward to calculate HNL and Zeta. you'll find that it's of order, you know, between three by four and half or something like that. So the question is, what is it in a bouncing scenario of interest? Well, there is a standard formalism, which is a decade and a half old, originally due to Maldacena for calculating three-point functions in a given inflationary or bouncing models. And what you need is essentially, you know, methods of perturbative quantum field theory. You have the three-point, I'm sorry, the third order action. Using the third order action, you calculate the corresponding three-point function and you can, you know, carry out this uh, uh, exactly for the matter bounds of our interest. So what you need to do is carry out an integral involving the modes, which are the tensor modes, and plug it in back in this expression. So you need to calculate this integral and the asymptotic forms of the tensor modes in order to be able to calculate the three-point function. And how does it behave? Well, uh, what has been plotted is HNL versus K by K0. K0 is a fundamental scale, so cosmological scales are much, much smaller than the fundamental scale of interest, which is roughly the Planck scale. And the first thing is that in contrast to D zeta, where it will be strictly constant, okay, it will be scale invariant, it is, behaves like K squared in a matter bound scenario. And secondly, the HNL is extremely small compared to D zeta. And there is another important point, you know, in the context of inflation, the amplitude of the modes freeze on super Hubble scales. And therefore, there is something known as the consistency relation, where you can relate the three-point function to the two-point function. But this, you know, assumes the constancy of the modes on super Hubble scales, which doesn't happen in the context of the bouncing models. The amplitude of the perturbations grow as one approaches the bounds. So you naively expect this consistency relation, which is valid in the so-called squeeze limit, when you calculate three-point functions, you have three scales involved. You are interested in one wave number, which is much, much smaller than the other two. So this mode is well outside the Hubble scale during inflation. Therefore, you expect the three-point function, since it's a constant, to be written in terms of the two-point function. But such a behavior doesn't happen in the context of bouncing models. Therefore, this consistency relation is violated. You know, there will be a difference in the behavior in the equilateral and the squeeze limits of the three-point function. They behave roughly the same way in the context of bouncing models. So if you are asking what is the, you know, what is a possible a uh, discriminatory tool, observational tool, to distinguish between bouncing and, uh, uh, and uh, inflationary models, it is the violation of this consistency condition the three, that describes the three-point functions. So I'm just going to, I'm hoping it will return. I'll wind it. This is my last slide. But as I mentioned, there are many, many, many problems which plague, uh, uh, plague uh, uh, bouncing scenarios. The first is, you know, in inflation, if you have classical perturbations on sub Hubble scales, as the universe expands through an accelerated phase, they will decay. But that will not happen. You know, you just have to solve your Mesoros equation in a contracting universe, they will rapidly grow. And they'll be fairly large at the bounce. So in order to overcome this difficulty, you have to have a lot of fine tuning involved. So this is a problem, first problem in bouncing models. The second is, you know, uh, we have been since studying the tensors, we have been studying scalars as well. And the scalar perturbations too rapidly grow 
as one approaches the bounds. And in fact, for instance, it's very easy to show that the curvature perturbations will diverge exactly where the weak energy condition is violated. You can, what we can do is that you can go to some other gauges, circumvent this problem, evolve them through the bounds and evaluate the power spectra, uh, you know, uh, after the bounds, okay? I will describe in a different talk a little later, okay? But this is an issue, okay? Is it sufficient if the perturbations remain small in specific gauges? You know, one, another problem is that there are many models. It is easy to show in the particular matter bound scenario that I considered, uh, the tensor to scalar ratio before the bounds is of the order of 24 or so. This is just, you know, from the behavior of A of eta that you have. The question is, will the tensor to scalar ratio be small after the bounds? It is a challenge to construct symmetric bouncing scenarios where the tensor to scalar ratio after the bounds is consistent with the Planck constraints. We have been able to circumvent this problem. We've been able to construct models where this is true, okay? And the last of the points is that you know, the issue of reheating. I think this can be easily achieved. I just have to couple my scalar field with drives bounds to uh, uh, radiation and transfer. This is not an issue at all. The last point which I haven't addressed is scalar non-gaussianities. The scalar perturbations will grow as one approaches the bounds. The question is, are the scalar non-gaussianities large or small? Uh, there are some results in specific scenarios but I have personally have some concerns about the calculations that have been carrying out, carried out in these models. So I believe this issue of what is the non-Gaussianity in a bouncing scenario remains open. I'll stop here. Thank you for your attention. I have two quick comments and one question. So the first thing is that bouncing, the bouncing models are not the only viable uh, alternative models to inflation. Uh, second was about bicep. Actually, the data, which was wrong, uh, suggested that you get a blue tilt in the, the tensor modes, which was not what inflation uh, predicted. So the celebration was too I soon. Correct you. I should correct you on that first point. There are papers by Valerie Domke and his and uh, uh, her co-workers, where if you allow various effects, this is what I was talking about, this can be overcome if I allow some effects due to gauge fields during inflation. Well, so well, I can get a blue tilt. Okay, so inflation with blue tilt, not, are inflation you Inflation with blue tilt. Well, but not in, in a normal Any single field inflation. Any criticism of bouncing models, I will take it. Okay, so still but, different inflation. So, but you didn't, well, that's the problem with inflation. It's just like going to bazaar. Whatever you ask, you can uh, have it. But I'm saying that, uh, did you calculate the tilt in your calculations, in the I bouncing? I can introduce a tilt. I can what type of tilt? tilt? Because that's, that makes it falsifiable. Uh, so what I can, look, this is tensors, which is easy. I can just fool around with the Q and I can get you a tilt. There is a paper where my students have written where with a tilt. So what type of tilt you get? Uh, I, can, I think I can have both. I'll confirm this. Well, I, I think it, it's Then red. it's not falsifiable. So Sorry? you can get anything again. In bounces? Yes. Yeah. At this stage, my goal is to sufficiently kill inflation. That's, so that's bounces okay. come with, already that's come with enough problems. That's fine with me, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah you, you talk about the bounce, and I thought one of the advantages of bouncing models was it has multiple bounces, maybe an infinite number of bounces, and <sighs> then, and I didn't hear the word entropy mentioned at all, and that's one of the biggest problems I have with bouncing models, or any model that's supposed to be time infinite. I. I agree. There are, uh, yes, entropy problem is again a problem. It's not, it's not clear how it can be overcome. They can grow very to large quantities. Again, the fine tuning. I will pull them, put them together with the fine tuning issue where my classical perturbations have to be small. Another thing I haven't mentioned is if you have bouncing models, there is this famous BKL instability, which will grow. So you need to have your anisotropies very small. So there is a lot of fine tuning that needs to, you know, uh, uh, you have to fine tune a lot of things in order to ensure that those things are going, not going to affect your model. So it is, at this stage, bouncing models are highly unsatisfactory. Many of the problems have to be overcome. One way the ecpyrotic tries to do is not, you know, more like a loitering guy rather than a bouncing. You don't allow yourself to contract too much and you have a, you know, something which just slowly contracts for a very long time. 
and therefore it allows you to overcome the horizon problem, you can probably get around to extreme fine tuning. But then you need negative potentials, etc. So there are issues with boxing models. Undesirable, many undesirable issues. And last quick question. Yeah. Is, uh, I can generate magnetic fields in bouncing models. <laughs> um, I should. I, I should. <laughs> I should declare that uh, there is at present no inflationary or bouncing model which works to generate magnetic fields. But I didn't want to ask you that. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, what is the motivation? I mean, you. I can imagine that, for example, some quantum effect or something motivates you to consider a bounce. But if you are allow arbitrary stuff, or is it from higher dimension, then why not, why, why is Jayanth was so vehemently opposed when he looked at sea fields, which I had all this negative energy? Then. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> so now, now what happens is that um, you can ask, you know, one possible answer whether quantum gravitational, possible quantum gravitational effects can you know eff affect these perturbations. If quantum gravitational effects just change, let us say they just change the scale factor about the bounce, what will happen is that the shape of the spectra will remain across, will be continued across the bounce. Uh, it is just the amplitude. That will be an open question and it will depend on the details of the bounce. And it is for that reason safe to, for us to consider classical bounces in order to address these issues. So these are just toy models for you and you're not taking the energy momentum tensor which drives the bounce seriously. We need to, there are so-called Galilean models which are probably better motivated than the simple models I proposed where you know some of these difficulties can be alleviated to some extent. Uh, but you know whether quantum gravity will play a role or will not play a role is, uh, is open to question. If you permit me to allow a classical bounce, these questions can be answered in the fashion I have described. Okay, let's move on. So let's thank you. Thank you. See you again.